Please note that this podcast contains information regarding sensitive events, including domestic violence, assault, and abuse, as well as other triggering events, such as murder. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. When Alice jumped down the rabbit hole, she immediately regretted her decision. A rabbit hole is a metaphor for something that transports someone into a troubling, surreal state or situation. Welcome to Afterglow, the unveiling of the Idaho cult. This is season one, episode 12, the aftermath begins. This podcast will take you down the deepest of rabbit holes as it unfolds. The story is so compelling, so bizarre, and so heinous, it's impossible to look the other way. Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow were dedicated in the most horrible way to an ideology that should only be fiction. Instead, their ideology put them behind bars. Join us as we explore the lives, lies, and diabolical crimes of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. I'm your host, Kathy Brooks. Please follow and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. And we are going to go into the aftermath after Charles was murdered. But I need to backtrack a little bit and go over some of the timelines that came out after the FOIA docs, the documents that the police department in Arizona did release publicly. According to the FOIA documents, Charles arrived at Lori's residence at 7.35 a.m. on July 11th, 2019. When he got there, he texts Lori's brother, Adam Cox, to tell him he was there. Adam tells Charles Lori and Alex were planning something, and Charles replies, absolutely. Adam also tells Charles he was supposed to spend the night with Alex, but Lori blocked that plan. At 7.49 a.m., Charles' cell phone actually left the home. Chandler Police Department uses that as a time stamp for the approximate time that Charles was shot. What's awful is Charles most likely lay dead for 43 minutes before Alex called 911. At 7.52 a.m., Alex and Lori speak on the phone. At 8.06 a.m., Alex and Lori speak on the phone again. And then at 8.32, Alex calls 911. Uh I, I shot my brother-in-law. Okay, what part of his body is injured? Uh, in the chest. I'm sorry, where? In the chest. Okay, is he awake and responsive or unconscious? Unconscious. Okay, is he breathing? I can't tell. Okay, are you wanting? Are you willing to go over to him and check? Sure. At 8.48 a.m., Lori and Tylee came back to the home after they stopped at Burger King dropping off JJ at school and they stopped at Walgreens for new flip-flops. They must have left the house barefoot or did they have blood on their feet and they had to ditch those flip-flops or whatever they were wearing initially. I kind of think it's the second. Today I want to get into the timeline And I want to start with the day that Charles was murdered and go on from there. We already know from previous episodes that Lori was scrambling, not answering questions about Charles's murder. We even know that Colby was told initially, Colby, Lori's oldest son, that Charles had a heart attack. And then when he showed up at Lori's house, allegedly the same day as the pool party, the same day Charles was shot, he found out then that Uncle Alex had shot Charles. Let's listen to Colby talk to Justin Lum, Fox 10 Phoenix, about the day that Charles was murdered and what he knew. It was just a weird time. So she had been moving 
there. And I think she came back briefly. Then she left to Houston. Like it was just so much going on at that time. And on top of that, we're, li- we're living our own lives. We're trying to raise a baby who's a couple months old. So it, it's just one of those things. Like it was just, it was confusing. And they know? remained estranged. He, he got the home in Chandler for mm-hmm. her to rent right. with the kid, kids, but he wasn't necessarily living there. Right. Um, and then July 11th happens. Mm-hmm. You've seen the body cam. That's all coming after the fact. But take me back to that day and how you found out that Charles died. Yeah. Um, so I just got a phone call in the middle of the day and said that he had had a heart attack. And so I was like, wow. Like she said he had a heart attack at the house. So I'm thinking, wow, like Tylee sat there and saw him go down. My family had to watch him have a heart attack. Like that's horrible. And so my first thought is like, what, like, what is going on? Like, you're just in shock. Like I just sat there just in shock and I'm thinking like, okay, what do I need to do? Like, how can I help them? All I wanted to do is reach out and try to help them out. So your mom said he had a heart attack. mm -hmm. When did you find out he was shot by your uncle? Yeah. So when I went to the house, I walked in the door, hugged Tylee, thinking he still had a heart attack. I did not find out that he was shot. And what had happened until I went and talked to her in the house while I was there. So obviously when you walk in the door thinking one thing and you hear that, it just like immediately, like I just, I like froze up. I just, I had no words. I didn't know what to say. I was like, what are you saying? What are you talking about? How does she justify saying that she had, he initially had a heart attack to being shot? What yeah. Did she- how does she explain? She this? didn't. I, I said that. I said, why would I hear something different? Why would there not just be the initial conversation? So I don't know if she was scared of telling me like my reaction to it, because once I heard that, I was like, I just started going off. Like I just got like, I just started like cussing. Like I don't usually cuss, but I was just like freaking out. And I was like going at her. Like, why would you not tell me what was going on? Like, this is worse. This is a million times worse than what you said. So well, play back that conversation for me. You're what in the backyard mm-hmm. meeting her and what, what is she doing? She's sitting there and said, so you sit down and she's no, I just asked her. I said, what's going on? I said, what is going on? And she's told me the story, how they got in a fight and everything. And it just like, it's still like just that feeling, just like seriously, like a drop from right here, just through my body. Like just when I heard that he got killed, I was just like, more than I could really handle. You You're know? wondering how does a fight lead to him getting shot? Right? Exactly. How did it escalate? Yeah. What was the explanation for that? Did she have one? Because she was inside. Yeah. She said that they got in a fight, that they were physical, that Charles had the had taken the bat from Tylee, and then he, I guess Al went and got the gun to like stop him because he was in a rage, and then that was it. Is Charles known to ever be in a rage like that, the way she described? No. Not that I know of. I mean, I've never seen him just go berserk. Like you that. Grew just, up with him. Yeah. This is your dad, basically. Yeah, exactly. Describe him as a dad. You know, we. In a nutshell. Yeah, what he was. He was very like. He wanted to teach us as much as he could. He always had that like. I would want your life to be better than my life. So he was trying to connect to us in the way that we cared about, like you know, stuff that he would do. Like he always tried to help me with sports, even though he didn't know anything about basketball. We always talked about like I wanted to play college basketball and he was so involved in that because he knew that was our connecting piece. You know, we joked around and he was gone a lot of the time when I was younger, like he was on business trips and stuff. And so I didn't see him a ton, like, you know, in that high school period. And then obviously I started moving around for school, but him as a person, you know, he was a good person and he cared about people. And I noticed him changing himself around for the better. Like he was trying to give that type of effort, you know, to everybody He was trying to show like how much you love JJ, how much you love my mom. Like he was really trying to show it because he wasn't that type of like really, uh, like he wasn't really sensitive, but he was. Like he didn't show sensitivity in that way. Like, you know. Affection. Yeah, exactly. But he was, it just wasn't, it wasn't physically showing in that way. But overall, would you say this was a solid male role model for you growing up? Yeah, he was, he was. And he, he tried really hard. Even when he didn't know, he tried really hard to like figure it out. Now, in your mom's statement to police, she says that, you know, they've been having problems with Charles could be, I don't know, not physically abusive, but verbally could go and get, get angry just like that. And maybe he was all about JJ, wasn't about Tylee. What would you say about that from your perspective? Was there 
sort of different type of relationship, favoritism, anything like that? I think you really cared about Tyler. I think that it's hard to connect. I think they had a hard time just connecting because my mom's attention was focused on Tylee. And then when we got JJ, her attention really focused on JJ. And so Tylee kind of turned into like a second mom in a sense. So JJ started taking care of him. And so Tylee and Charles would kind of butt heads on things for JJ, but Tylee's not the parent. And so that was, I think, one of their power struggles is that Tylee wanted to do things for JJ like a parent. She felt that role for him. And so they had a good relationship. He really did put that effort in, but I think the disagreements were, you know, between the chain of command, like who he was not overstepping boundaries with my mom to her daughter. Right. And so it kind of created a, a struggle. Cause it's not really his daughter. It's a step. Exactly. So there's exactly. this barrier, yeah. but nothing to the extent of where, Oh, like, could he be hurtful or harmful? No, him? I don't think so. You never saw that. No. And by that time, or so you're, you're out of the house, you're doing your own thing, you're in college, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this, this shooting happens, you leave, you're upset with your mom. Next time you speak to her is when? Um, I don't even remember. Probably a couple of days after that. Okay. Um, I checked in on her. You know, I wanted to know how Tyler was doing, how JJ was doing, and basically figure out what is your plan? Like, what are you guys doing now? Did you talk to Tylee about this, though, after you found out the truth? Yeah. Mom? Yeah. What, well, where is her head at? She, she seemed like the type of person to try to, like, numb it. Like, she tried to, like, just brush it off like it wasn't that big of a deal to her in a sense like i don't think she could handle that emotion so she seemed like she was just like just trying to like make it through it if that makes sense so i don't know what happened with her in the situation but i know that she was sitting there like trying to like cope with it but also like didn't know how so she was just like oh yeah well everything's fine it's really hard but i'm gonna be okay like that was her mentality so i personally was like tylee like if you need anything like talk to me please call me come over like i'm trying to be a support system for you you know? did it hit her right away that it was real that it happened and i know that when the fight started mm -hmm. and she had the bat taken away uh, the report says she goes to the car so she wasn't physically inside right. there when the gunshots went off but did you ask your mom about her driving away in charles's rental car for whatever reason i know jj was in the car yeah. buckled in but what what did she say about that? And nothing. her husband just right. died. Yeah, nothing. I didn't know that about the rental car. I didn't know about the details of it. I thought that what happened was they got in the fight and that Tylee tried to take JJ out or went to go, you know, with with him and that my mom was either following behind them or whatever. So I didn't get that detail. I heard the details of the fight itself. And so that's what I was like. You didn't have the detail shot. that that your mom heard the gunshot and was inside yeah. and actually looked and yeah. she saw Charles Yeah, and Alex calls 911. She didn't mention that. She yeah. didn't get into that and, no. drive, and driving off. Did she open up to the point? Was she emotional or how was your mom's demeanor? Yeah. She seemed, she seemed like sad, but like really calm. Like I thought she was trying to be really strong and be in that place. Like, I'm going to like try to handle this situation. And she's like, this is awful. This is horrible. And, you know, obviously my reaction, like I'm an emotional person. Like when I heard that, like I was like losing my mind. So I was like, I stood up. I was like, just, I couldn't. What were you, you most know, mad about though? Because you, you're standing up in emotion, but what, were you mad at her? Or what were you, I was just what was mad. the center of it that was yeah. angering you? I was just so mad that he got killed. Like it just didn't, no matter what happened, I just don't feel like he had to die for it. I felt like there's a million different, I mean, if you pull a gun on me, like I'm not gonna, I'm not Superman. Like I'm not gonna come at you and try to like keep going no matter how angry. So it just really didn't make sense. And I just still wanted to support them emotionally, but I didn't know how to feel for myself and I didn't know how to cope with it for them. Like I didn't know how to even give them that type of assurance that everything would be okay because I just didn't, I didn't know. And you really don't know what happened. Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, the story was like, when you hear just like, if I'm honest, like when I heard just the part that he was shot, like, it's like your ears just ring, like things are being said, but it was just the story. But there wasn't like that, like way to like wrap your mind around what she was saying as much. It just, all I heard about was the fight. And then I went inside and I wanted to talk to Tylee and see how she was doing. So like, and then you left. Yeah. And was Alex there? Mm -hmm. Was you talked to him? He was just sitting on the couch. He had a, a thing around his head and he was just sitting there. And so I just like kind of looked at him. I didn't really talk to him. 
I didn't know had anything. So when I walked in, I saw him, passed him, went outside, talked to my mom, looked at him. It's just like, didn't say hi. It's just one of those things. So I mean, obviously, I was like, I just looked at him. He said hi. I was like, hi. You know, not thinking anything of it, but because, but at that point, when you see him, mm -hmm. you didn't know that he shot him. Yeah, exactly. You you think that it's a heart attack. Yeah. And then you come back and you know he shot him. Yeah. So it's just your mind looking at your uncle like. I don't know. You... I just I was in so much shock and I just felt like it would have been more chaos, but it wasn't. And so it just one of those things where like I was like, okay, maybe I should try to like bring it down and just be the one that's like strong enough to describe be the injury on his head. You know, he had an ice pack. He had a he just had a wrap around his head, so I don't know he what didn't it was. See it, but it, yeah, I didn't got, see anything. He says he got hit with a metal bat on the head, and mm -hmm. he gets up and he he gets a gun. Like he, he I know he's no one's Superman, but he, he got hit with the metal bat and got up. And now that yeah. you've seen the body cam, you've heard the the nine one call. I'm not asking you to be the judge here, but I mean, now you have more information. Yeah. How do you really wrap your head around this? What are you thinking when you see all the details now? I to be honest with you, I still haven't even come up with an answer for that. Watching the body cam, watching and seeing Charles like that moment, like just shifted everything for me. And that hurt and that anger kind of came back. And like that feeling had been like I like felt the way I felt that day, just again like drop. Like, but now it's real. And that's something I feel like I didn't actually get to with this is that wow he's actually gone like that's unreal because we hadn't talked right so it's almost like if you don't see it it's like different seeing him gone that was like the hit so i just for her case for that case like i still just don't know i've tried to piece it together it just doesn't none of it makes sense to me so just sitting there trying to like fathom it i just can't do you feel like chandler police is missing something. The investigation is... So Lori open. is wrapped up in lies. Lies that can be proven. That's what really blows my mind about Lori. Like, she literally tells different stories to different people. I want to play a little clip of something for you of Ty Lee with, playing with her friend and recording a video that was found on YouTube. A secret that nobody knows. Ready? Go! I don't know. I don't want to say anything on camera. This is very sexual. I break into the song around your surrounding, about your surroundings. Ready? Go. I don't know. I'm so bad at this. Wait, can we restart? Nope. No. Nope. Hold your breath and start intensely without laughing. And stare intensely without laughing. Ready? Go. <laughs> I promise everyone who's watching, it's so much harder than it looks. And call each letter like out like a cheerleader. Okay, ready? Okay, ready? Go. T to the Y to the L to the double E. Your signature football goal celebration. Ready? Go. Woo! That's it. I don't know. Woo! Go Broncos! No, no Broncos. No Broncos. That video you can see, it is on my third part of my show on Left Undone Incomplete Investigations. It's Missing Vanished Part 3, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, Tylee Ryan, JJ Vallow. And the published date was January 21st, 2020, when I posted it and found that clip of Tylee. So cute. So now we're going to go ahead and get into the timeline a little bit about the kids and some background information and just what we can dig up, up until from the time Charles was shot. And of course, this will be several episodes going into this as well. Now, according to a woman that Charles went on a date with the night before he was murdered, her name is Nancy Joe. That is how she's referred to in the police FOIA documents, Nancy Joe. Uh, she was told by Charles that Charles had planned to meet up with Adam Cox, who was Lori's other brother, after dropping JJ off at school on the day that he was shot. So that was the plan that they were going to meet up and talk about how to have some kind of intervention to try to get Lori straightened out or whatever they needed to do. 
So according to the FOIA documents, the police detective had met with Nancy Joe. Her last name is redacted. He met with her and did this interview in April of 2020, April 22nd, 2020. And it says, I spoke with Nancy Joe. Nancy Joe had gone on a date with Charles Vallow on July 10th, 2019, the night before he was shot and killed. Nancy Joe had been given my information by Kay. Obviously, it's Woodcock, but it's redacted. I had briefly spoken to Nancy Joe about a month prior, but at the time, she was not sure if she wanted to be involved in this investigation. My interview with Nancy Joe was recorded on my digital voice recorder and will be preserved as evidence in this case. The following is a synopsis of my interview with Nancy Joe. For full details, refer to the original audio recording, which I don't believe has been released to the public, but I will be digging to find out. Nancy Joe said she had met Charles at the Keg restaurant near Santan Mall on July 10th, 2019. Nancy Joe explained she met Charles through an LDS dating site in early July, and they chatted online until they went out on July 10th. Nancy said she and Charles spoke via telephone and text message after exchanging phone numbers. Nancy said Charles was a very upbeat person. Nancy Joe said Charles told her about his split with his wife. Nancy Joe also said that Charles told her that Lori had disappeared for a few months, canceled his flights, taken his truck, changed his door knock, changed his door locks, and also drained his bank account. Nancy Joe explained that Charles told her that Lori stated she was preparing for the second coming of Christ, which was supposed to happen in July. Nancy Joe said Charles told her Lori said she had angels that would help her kill him if he got in her way. Nancy Joe said Charles said Lori believed she could teleport to other places through a portal in her closet. Nancy said Charles told her Lori believed she was sealed to Moroni in another life and she lived other lives, including notable people in history. The detective says, I asked Nancy Joe if Charles said anything about how things were going between him and Lori at that time. Nancy Joe said Charles was concerned with JJ being involved in Lori's craziness. Nancy Joe said Charles told her about Lori's teenage daughter, Tylee, and how she was rebellious against Lori, but was very close to JJ. He goes on to say, I asked Nancy Joe if Charles said why he was in town, and she said he was in town to see JJ. Nancy Joe said Charles was going to take JJ to school the next morning. Nancy said Charles told her Lori was writing an email from him to other people pretending to be Charles. Nancy explained that Charles discovered the emails and was speaking to Lori's brother, Adam, about this. He was supposed to meet Adam on July 11th, 2019, after Charles was to drop off JJ at school to discuss how to confront Lori about her beliefs that she was a god and here to usher in the second coming of Christ. Nancy Joe said Charles and Adam wanted to get Lori help for those behaviors. Nancy said she and Charles finished dinner about 10 o'clock and text until about 11 p.m. Nancy said she sent Charles a text the next morning, but she never heard back from him. Nancy Joe talked about their date and their conversation during it. I asked Nancy Joe if there was anything she thought I should know about her interaction with Charles. Nancy Joe said Charles still had JJ's service dog in Texas, and Charles was concerned that Bailey was not with JJ. Nancy Joe said it was hard to believe from what she knew and saw in the media that if Charles struck Alex with a bat, that he would not have injured him more. Nancy Joe said Charles was in very good condition and took good care of himself. The detective goes on to say, I asked Nancy Joe if Charles ever mentioned Lori's brother Alex, and she said that he had. Nancy Joe said Charles described Lori and Alex's relationship as strange and added that Lori had weird control or power over him. I asked Nancy Joe if Charles said anything to her about his relationship with Alex, and she said they had a fine relationship, but it became a little strained since they were getting divorced. Nancy Joe added that Charles believed Lori was having an affair with a doomsday writer and added that he had found where Lori had emailed videos of her dancing to the writer who she later named as Chad. I asked Nancy Joe if Charles ever mentioned Chad's name to her or if she learned it from the media, 
and she said she was not sure. Nancy Joe said Charles was not happy about the email he had found, that it was authored under his name, but not by him to the author. God. Nancy Joe added that Charles did not like who Lori had become since she started interacting with Chad. Nancy Joe said, since seeing the media coverage on this case, it was clear Charles was talking about a person who fits Chad's description. Nancy Joe said Charles only wanted Lori to get some help so she could be there for JJ. Nancy Joe said Charles seemed very patient with Lori in light of what had been going on. He said, I asked Nancy Joe if Charles ever mentioned his life insurance policy, and she said that he did. Nancy Joe said Charles told her he had changed his beneficiary on the policy. Nancy Joe said she joked with Charles that he should let Lori know that he changed it so she did not kill him for the life insurance policy. Nancy Joe said in hindsight that was not a funny joke. Nancy Joe and I talked about how excited Charles was to go see JJ and to spend time with them. Nancy Joe spoke for a while about how kind and happy Charles was in their interactions. Nancy Joe said Charles never once spoke harshly against Lori, even after all that she had done. He says, I asked Nancy Joe if Charles said he ever tried to reach out to Chad, and she said she could not remember for sure if he had. Nancy Joe said Charles felt there was an inappropriate relationship with each other. Nancy Joe said she still had the text messages between her and Charles, and she would go through them to see if there was anything that was important to this case, and she would forward them to me. I then provided Nancy Joe with my contact information, and then I concluded my interview with Nancy Joe. Sounds like he was moving on right before all this went down, but Lori was clearly all about getting rid of him because he was Ned or Nick or whatever the zombie dude and clearly it was about money don't let anybody fool you if we don't think it's about money because she was mad when she found out she was mad when she found out that that money was going to Kay. on the 11th of 2019 there was a text and we went over this before but since it's coming together a little bit i want to go over it again and then the reply on july 11th 2019 at 23 31 so 11 31 p.m Zalema to Lori. Zalema, remember? As I was working on Hiplos today in the temple, I was told he will be taken as he is. I don't know what that means. Then I was shown to only put light, the brightest light from the top and the bottom at the same time, meeting in the middle. So I've been doing that all day. The next day, 7-12, July 12th, 2019, at 2236 hours, so 1036 p.m., Zulema to Julie Clement. Oh, okay. Hiplos is gone. I remember he was Ned and then he was Hiplos. So she is telling Julie Clement, Hiplos is gone. She says, It was a Nephi and Laban ending. I will tell you more when I see you in person or when you see Lori in person. I'm leaving for Chile on Monday for two weeks. And then Zalema to Julie, right? I'm just happy it's over. According to Mormon doctrine, Nephi is a prophet in the Book of Mormon and is commanded by his father, Lehi, to return to Jerusalem to obtain brass plates that contain genealogy records from Laban. And excuse me if I screw up the Mormon names because I'm not LDS and I pronounce everything wrong. I just do when it comes to different names. Sorry. Nephi and his two brothers, Laman and Lemuel, return to Jerusalem. When Laman attempts to get the plates from Laban, he is chased off in fear of his life. As Laban says, he will slay him. They later return to Laban with all of their valuables and are chased off again. Nephi later goes to Laban's house and finds him passed out drunk. Nephi is commanded to slay Laban as he was delivered into Nephi's hands. Nephi uses Laban's sword to kill Laban. Apparently this is in the Book of Mormon, 1st Nephi chapter three through four. So they're like, okay, we've been waiting for this. Sorry, oh, thank goodness, it's finally over. Hiplos is gone. It's all been taken care of. These people are wackadoodles. And you can see why Zulema has Use immunity because she is giving up some information 
can't wait to see her on the stand at the trial, even though she's a horrible person because she was involved in all of this. I guess sometimes you have to make a deal with the devil to get the main people, Chad and Lori. And then on the 12th, that's when Lori started her conversation with the, her stepsons, telling them about Charles passing. And then also on that day, Cheryl Wheeler. Cheryl Wheeler is Charles's ex-wife and the father of Zach and Cole, Nicholas and Zach, who are Charles's older sons. The ones that Lori was like, hey, by the way, via text, your dad's dead, by the way. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm really busy. I got to put JJ to bed. That's them. Cheryl is their mother. She finds out from the medical examiner's website that Charles' death has been classified as a homicide. She then searches Google for more information and discovers from news reports out of Chandler, Arizona, that Alex Cox had shot him. So remember, Lori's keeping everybody in the dark. There's an article from Nate Eaton of East Idaho News, and it says here, Cheryl Wheeler will never forget how she found out her ex-husband, Charles Valla, was dead. It was July 2019, and Cheryl was in her Austin, Texas home when her 24-year-old son, whose father is Charles, walked into the room. He had just literally received a text from Lori saying his dad was dead. Cheryl tells EastIdahoNews.com. We were shocked. He tried calling her back. He tried texting, but Lori would not answer. And we all know, hi, boys. I have some very sad news. Your dad's dead, um, but I'm super busy. And, you know, I'll get back to you when I can. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but literally not even kidding. That is her attitude in the whole thing, right? So Cheryl says, I checked the medical examiner's website and found Charles had been killed the day before, and they had it classified as a homicide, Cheryl recalls. We further Googled and saw all the news reports out of Chandler. We found out that Alex Cox, Lori's brother, had shot him. Cheryl and Charles had met in 1991 through mutual friends, and they were living in Austin, Texas at the time and were married within a year. She said he was very charming and always dressed very nicely. She said he's definitely a salesman. Cheryl said he helped a lot of people and had a lot of good friends. And he came from a big family who was very close. And here was this interesting guy from Louisiana that ended up in Austin. They were married for 12 years. They had two sons and the boys adored their father. And Charles was nicknamed the Disneyland dad because he was so much fun. He would take them fishing and to campouts and Boy Scouts and just loved doing all that, Cheryl recalls. Charles was an athlete, but my boys were not into baseball or football. They did rowing and soccer, and he was very, very supportive of all their activities. Cheryl and Charles did divorce in 2003, and Cheryl remarried in 2006, and Charles married Lori Ryan in Las Vegas. She had previously been married to Joe Ryan, as we know. And they had Tylee together. Charles was raised Catholic, but he did convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints after meeting Lori, a lifelong Latter-day Saint. Cheryl remembers first meeting her at her son's baseball game and thinking she was a nice woman. We were sitting next to each other and she looked at me and said, you probably think I'm an idiot because I'm with your ex-husband. Cheryl says, I found that very funny, but that was the only pleasant moment we ever had in all those years. The women had little interaction, although Cheryl and her husband shared custody of the two boys with Charles and Lori. The boys would spend weekends, summers, and alternating holidays with their dad while remaining with their mom the rest of the time. A year after Charles and Lori got married, Cheryl became concerned about Lori's mental state. So that goes way back. She just seemed off. There were a lot of strange going-ons at their home to the point that a judge ordered cameras to be put in their home to protect the children, Cheryl recalls. Nothing suspicious or criminal was ever found on the video footage, Cheryl said, but she said something wasn't right with Lori. During child custody hearings, Cheryl said that Lori seemed to enjoy being in court and all the drama surrounding it. Lori was also in a butt custody battle with Joe Ryan, which we went all over that initially with this podcast. And they fought and fought over this custody battle, and she said, but was really interesting after Cheryl and 
and Charles spent thousands and thousands of dollars in this custody dispute. They were amazed and perplexed when Charles and Lori announced they were moving to Arizona. Despite the move, Cheryl's sons continued to spend summers with their father and his wife, Lori. But the circumstances were unusual, Cheryl said. The way they would describe it is that their dad went to work and Lori would leave. She has never had a job that I've known of other than being a hairdresser before they married. But she would leave and go be with her family or do other things, Cheryl says. Cheryl's sons were in the home with Tylee and Colby, Ryan, Lori's son from her second husband, William LaGoya. In 2014, Charles and Lori adopted JJ, Fallow from a family member, and Cheryl's kids love spending time with their new half-brother. So my boys adore him. They have funny stories and funny videos with him. He's their brother, she says. Social media posts indicate that sometime in 2014, Charles and Lori moved to Kauai in Hawaii, And they operated the small juice business on the island. They moved back to Arizona between 2016 and 2017. So when they returned, Charles spent thousands of dollars getting a properly trained service dog for JJ, who has autism. Bailey, a labradoodle, became JJ's best friend. And Cheryl's sons love spending time with their stepbrother and his dog. So that was a little bit about the background where Cheryl and her opinions and what she had to say about all of this and how tragic it obviously it was to everybody on that side of the family. Also on July 12th, you know, Lori attempted to file a claim on Charles Vallow's life insurance policy. And she discovered on that day that she had been removed as the beneficiary. On July 13th, there was an autopsy performed on Charles And on July 13th, Kay and Larry Woodcock hop a plane and go to Phoenix. And we did play that phone call already a couple episodes back where Kay's like, I don't know what's going on. You know, we just showed up. We don't know where we're staying. You know, Larry obviously was super cool and nice to the detective. And they planned to talk to him on that Monday. Then on July 13th, so we're still two days after Charles was murdered, Lori and Melanie Boudreaux, who's her niece, Melanie, Melanie the niece, married to Brandon Boudreaux, exchange, so Lori and Melanie niece exchange a series of messages that day. At 10.25 a.m., Melanie says, Adam just called Brandon and told him Al murdered Charles. He put it on speaker for me to hear. And she says, can you talk, please? Then Melanie says, I think Brandon found out earlier. He seemed in shock a few hours ago. And then Adam and Brandon tried to use the situation to their advantage. He cornered me, put it on speaker to tell me. Then Brandon said, do you still believe everything you believe? So Brandon was obviously getting weirded out by his wife. And they have four small children who's buying into this Uncle Alex, Lori, Chad crap, right? So now he's like, okay, Charles was shot. Do you still believe everything you believe? And they also were in the middle of the separation. Melanie says, Brandon is with the moving truck at my new address, moving things. I'm at the house with the kids. And Lori says, call me. So Lori's smart enough. She doesn't want this stuff all in text message, right? At 5.19 p.m. that same day, Melanie says, does Tylee have a phone or a way to contact Brandon or Adam? And Lori says, nope, I still have it. So Lori took Tylee's phone away from her during all this stuff. So then on July 14th, Adam left. And we'll go into Adam's story of how everything went down as well um, in an episode coming up soon. Adam leaves Phoenix, returns home to Kansas on July 14th. So then July 14th through July 19th, 2019, Alex Cox, the shooter, the brother... He flies from Arizona to Columbia, South America. According to the police FOIA documents, it says the last book travel was between July 14th, 2019 and July 19th, 2019 by Alex. He booked a trip between Phoenix and Columbia. Border crossing history indicates he took this flight. He doesn't have any other border crossing history after this July trip. And she says Lori's last border crossing activity occurred in September of 2017 when she took a trip to Cancun. And JJ was also negative for border activity. Uh, 
Detective Nathan Moffat says there's a picture of Alex in Columbia on social media from 2016. So it establishes that he did have a history of going to Columbia. And then on July 15th, you know, after all the back and forth with the Lori being very evasive with the text messages with Charles' sons, Charles' son Cole and his ex-wife Cheryl fly to Phoenix to meet with the Chandler Police Department. And what's really interesting is July 15th is the date that Melanie Gibbs says she found out that Charles was shot. I have a really hard time believing that because as close as those two were with their podcast and everything and that Lori had asked her to leave the night before the shooting, I'm surprised that she just off and didn't talk to her for four days and Lori didn't update her. Um, I still have a really hard time with that one. The way that went down is Lori had told Melanie Gibb the day before Charles was shot that she needed to leave her house. Melanie had spent the night there because Charles was going to shoot her. So Lori said to Melanie, and I heard this from one of Melanie Gibb's friends too that I had spoken to when all my channel started and people were reaching out to me. She said that Melanie Gibb had spent the night at Lori's or was going to, she had spent the night there, I guess a couple nights or, and she was there that night before Charles was shot and Lori said, you need to get out of here because Charles is going to come shoot me. And so Melanie Gibb left. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that Melanie Gibb never checked on her. If she, if Lori was like, Hey, get, you got to go. Charles is going to come shoot me. And then Melanie's like, okay, bye. And never checks on Lori. Come on. I really have a hard time with that. I am very happy that we have Melanie Gibb as a witness, but I also have a really hard time believing everything Melanie Gibbs says because there's just too many wonky wonky things going on here so then on the 15th through the 16th Lori Vallow and Colby they fly from Phoenix to Houston and return the next day so when they went to Houston Colby and Lori got a lot of Charles's personal belongings his F-150 truck clothes, computers, electronics. And then apparently they left them at the airport for Alex to retrieve. And then Alex flew out to Houston and drove Charles's truck back to Arizona. On July 16th, 2019, a guy by the name of Ian Pulowski who will eventually be the husband of Melanie Boudreaux, Melanie's the niece of Lori. He divorced his wife. Later, you'll learn that it's kind of a really weird thing, too, because as fast as him and Melanie got together and it was just so random, there's a lot of suspect in that whole thing. Again, that will be another rabbit hole. So many rabbit holes, you guys. That's why I start every podcast with a rabbit hole, <laughs> you know, blah, blah, blah. That's why this podcast is really hard to keep everything in a chronological order because there are, you know, it's like turn left, turn right, upside down. There's another hole. Let's go down this one. Oh, let's go down that one. Let's go back to this one. So bear with me. I'm really hoping that this is working for you guys and you're getting a good, clear, pic- the best picture I could actually make out of it. Interestingly enough, on July 18th, Cole Vallow tells Ch- Chandler detective Nathan Moffat that Kay Woodcock warned him and his family that Lori's brother Adam Cox had contacted her to tell her that the family had disowned him a year a year ago. But Kay found pictures of him with his family on social media since then. So Kay was a little suspicious, like, what's going on with Adam? Adam told her his family disowned, but then Kay's really good at snooping. Kay's like, Kay should be a a detective, like, seriously. Without Kay snooping and investigation, probably almost none of this would be coming to trial. Kay is the key right here. She got into it. She got down and dirty and Charles's computers, looking for things, finding things. You'll see. But Kay is a huge key and insisting on where is my grandson?
and we're taking off the carpet cottage. Okay, thank you for writing. Okay. Okay, why y'all eat it? <laughs> All right. Coastal Crew Change. Welcome to Coastal Crew Change. Welcome to Coastal Crew Change. I'm your bus driver, JJ. I'm the bus driver, Peppa. And I'm also your MC. <laughs> I'm also it's all side and yeah. Woo! Thanks for riding coastal. And I can go. Pull it away from your mouth a little bit and we can hear you better. Say hi. Say hi to Mama and, hi, Dad. and Dad. Hi, Dad. Say miss you. I miss you. And we kind of miss y'all too. Just, just a little bit. Too. But we're having fun. We're having fun. All right. Say bye. Bye. Papa, tell me more. Papa, open the one. Oh, oh, oh. Da 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 Turn out the lights. The party's over. <laughs> they say that all good things must end. Call it a night. The party's over. You need to go on American Johnny, Idol. Johnny, Johnny, yes, Papa. Yeah. <laughs> but you gotta do the coastal crew change. It won't come to coastal crew change. Welcome to the coastal crew change. Uh, 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 and, uh, hey, and say, the driver is Papa Larry Woodcock. The, the driver is Papa Larry Woodcock. Say thank you. Thank you. And come back. Come back. And pay your bill on time. Yeah. Pay your bill that on was time. courtesy Kresha. She has a YouTube channel, Difficult Research. And Kresha is actually JJ's aunt. She's Kay Woodcock's daughter. So Charles was her uncle. And she has an excellent YouTube channel where she goes over a lot of this stuff that went on. And this is her family. So you can check her out at Difficult Research on YouTube. Give her a look. On July 18th, 2019, Bori and Kay speak on the phone. And Kay did record that conversation. I have not come across it. I don't think it's out there. Probably something that will be played at trial, I'm sure. On July 18th, 2019, Melanie Gibb sends an email out to all her followers with an invitation to meet in Lori Vallow's home, where Charles had just been shot and killed a week earlier. And the point of this invitation is for them to come hear her boyfriend at the time, David Warwick, speak. Here's a clip of David Warwick in court explaining that he met Lori Vallow for the first time during that event that Melanie invited everybody to at Lori Vallow's house very soon after Charles was shot. What was that? Are you familiar with Lori Vallow Dado? Yes. When did you meet her? I met her in the uh, first week of August. Uh, 2019. Where was that? At her home. Where was her home? Gilbert, Arizona. Okay. Was Chad Daybell there? Yes. So that was the first time that David Warwick, who is Melanie Gibbs' boyfriend at the time, met Lori Vallow. Now, in my opinion, as they were getting ready for this big meeting at Lori's house, Chad actually is basically preparing everyone and he sends Lori a message providing trust levels of those that she needs to be aware of. He gives them a zero to a hundred rating. Melanie Gibb, Chad gives her a 97. Zalema gets a 96. Alex Cox gets a 94. Thor, 
gets a 94. Nicole, who we will get more into Nicole eventually, gets an 86. Melanie Boudreaux, Melanie niece, gets an 85. Nicole gets an 86. We will get more into Nicole later. Melanie Boudreaux, which is Lori's niece, Melanie, she gets an 85. Summer Shiflet, Lori's sister, gets a 40. Jason Mao gets a 31, which I find kind of interesting, but I also see a little bit of Chad's patterns when he doesn't like people around Lori. And I think he was somewhat maybe threatened by Jason Mao a little bit because Lori and Melanie Gibb were doing the podcast with him. And let's face it, Jason Mao is not a person that I have any respect for whatsoever in this whole thing, but he's better looking than Chad. So Chad would be, I think, a little bit intimidated and insecure about Lori spending so much time with Jason Mao. So he's given him a, this is just my opinion, he's given him a 31. Serena gets an 18. And again, we'll get more into Serena. Janie gets a 15. Christina gets an 8. Again, Christina will come up as well. Barry gets an 8. Barry is Lori's dad, Barry Cox. April Raymond gets a seven. April Raymond is really interesting. Her mother used to reach out to me. We spoke on the phone several times. We talked. She gave me a lot of information when I started my YouTube channel, but in the end, April Raymond had told her mother she's not allowed to speak to me being a YouTuber because her mother gave me information that apparently I repeated and April Raymond did not like that. So whatever. April Raymond got a bad rating from Chad as it is. And I do know in April Raymond's interviews, I think it was either Dateline or 48 Hours or whatever, they had approached her and said, congratulations, you're one of the 144,000. And she was like, oh yeah, no thanks. Because she said they told her she couldn't bring her children with her. So yeah, any normal mother is going to be like, yeah, I'll pass. <laughs> I'll pass. I'm not ditching my kid. Unlike Lori. Um, Adam, Lori's brother, Adam got a zero. So they were not trusting him at all at this point. And they clearly knew that he was with, you know, going in with Charles to help stop Lori from all her insanity. But Charles wound up dead. And then there's Stacy, Talia, Audrey, and Raphael. And they all get 100. I'm assuming Stacy is Lori's late sister, Melanie, Melanie Niece's mom, who had passed away. July 20th, Lori Vallow buys Chad Daybell a ticket, an airplane ticket, from Provo, Utah to Arizona for $259.50. So he is clearly coming to this meeting. He gave her his list, and David Warwick is going to speak. And he just we just heard the clip of him in court explaining when he first met uh, Lori. So here's the email that I believe was the setup to get Chad down to Arizona for this Melanie Gibb meeting at Lori's house, which was to take place the first week of August, as David Warwick just said in that little clip. So this email, Charles found this email and he confronted Lori on June 29th about it. He accused her of making a fake email account in his name to send to Chad. And this is the message. And this was only two weeks before Charles was shot and killed. Hello, Chad. I hope you're doing well. This is Charles Vallow from Arizona. We really enjoyed having you stay with us back in November when you came to the Preparing a People conference. I appreciated you taking time to talk to me about the book I've been working on. Well, more than six months later, I still haven't made much progress on it but I feel an urgency to get it done. As the managing partner of Wright Planning Group, I'm going to have the opportunity to speak at various conventions beginning in the fall, but everyone says I need to have a book available that summarizes my life and shares the principles I follow. So I will cut to the chase. I am willing to pay you well to help me get this book into shape as my ghost writer. I really liked your autobiography and the tone you took in sharing experiences without preaching. Is there any way you could come here for a couple of days and help me get the book underway? 
I feel talking in person would be much more valuable than a phone call or video chat, mainly because I would like you to read through some of my journals and explain to me how the publishing industry works. It would help me know whether I truly have a book in me and whether you want to team up on it. I played minor league baseball and have plenty of stories that my audience can relate to, along with the knowledge I've gained running my own company. So I do feel the book would contain valuable information even beyond the convention circuit. I'm out of town until Saturday, but would gladly fly you down here early next week before the holiday and cover your expenses. You could stay in our guest room like before or in a hotel if you prefer. I hate to take you away from your family, but I know this book is vital to my speaking success. I understand if you don't want to take part in this project, but I would definitely make it worth your time. With admiration, Charles. They truly are all living on a throne of lies. July 22nd, 2019. That is approximately the date that Lori told Life Academy, JJ School, that Charles Vallow had committed suicide. And, you know, Lori makes crap up. And Lori tells everybody different stories. Lori told Colby that Charles had a heart attack. Lori tells JJ School that he committed suicide. And it's all over the news in Arizona, Lori. So I'm pretty sure people watched the news. It was local. So I don't know why. I mean, they were probably like, okay, this lady is wackadoodle, whack, whacked, whacked. Seriously, sums up. On July 22nd, 2019, Lori emails the dog trainer for JJ's service dog, Bailey, and tells him to come pick up Bailey. So according to the FOIA documents, they interviewed a man by the name of Neil Mestas, M-E-S-T-A-S, who was the dog trainer for JJ's service animal. Neil said Lori emailed him on July 22nd, 2019 to return the dog as a result of Charles's death. Lori did not provide specifics on how Charles died. Oh, she didn't give Mike up some new story for this guy, I guess. Neil agreed and picked up the dog on August 15th. And he did recall seeing the children at that time. Interestingly enough, on July 23rd, Lori Vallow, she tells Kay Woodcock that JJ will not be coming to Louisiana for his father's funeral. There's an email from Kay that talks about this. So she writes to Nathan Moffat, the police detective, and she says, Hi, Nathan. I just ran across this. I completely forgot about it. Interesting. This is him speaking to us. Also, Mike Cagle is a dear family friend and an attorney. He grew, he grew up with us. He and Charles have been buddies since grade school. Please feel free to disclose anything to him. He is one of our advisors for settling Charles's personal business affairs. I hope Adam contacted you and I hope it was helpful to you. Cole and Zach's mom, Cheryl, warned me to be very careful of what we tell Adam or his wife, Nicole, or his sister-in-law and brother, Adam. Cheryl had an issue with Adam when Charles and Lori were going through court battle with Lori's ex and Cheryl. Lastly, Lori is not going to allow JJ to come to Lake Charles for his dad's memorial service. We are extremely distraught about it. This is war. Later today, I'm calling an attorney in Hawaii where Charles reached out to when he was filing for divorce, but never followed through. I'm hiring a private investigator to see if she's already got next, her next husband lined up. Charles suspected she was having an affair with a cult leader. Don't know his name, but Lori would make video of herself dancing, then send them to him. She used Charles's computer or email to send one and he found it. We are going to sue for at least grandparent visitation rights. And if we have a fighting chance for full custody, I'll be damned if she's going to brainwash JJ 
into thinking his dad was no good and even worse, not keeping his memory alive. Sorry for rambling, but really upset us. I want you to know what we have in mind because I don't want it to interfere with your investigation. Have a good one. Okay. And on July 29th, 2019, through July 31st, Lori traveled to Oceanside, California with her brother, Alex Cox, and her niece, Melanie Boudreaux. It says here, the iCloud account was a long-standing account with activity dating back to 2011. The account contained photographs of JJ and Tylee as young children, as well as photographs of Charles and Lori during the time they were married. Photographs and videos on the account seem to capture many family vacations and milestones for the Vallow family. There are text messages about problems with the relationship, but nothing that would indicate Charles was abusive. There were also messages indicating Charles and Tylee would get into arguments with each other, but Lori also indicated that Tylee was being difficult for her as well. First indication of Chad Daybell was an audio file that was dated 11-17-2018. This audio file was a speech given by Chad Daybell in Arizona. Having listened to many of the audio files and reviewed countless text messages, it is apparent to me that Chad Daybell claimed he was a visionary and discovered this ability after a near-death experience when he jumped off a 60-foot cliff. Chad claimed that his spirit separated from his body and he had contact with family members in heaven. Chad indicated that this was what led him to author books that he has sold as fiction. After Chad and Lori met, they claimed to have been married in previous lives and were meant to be together again. There were countless messages regarding spiritual experiences and Lori and Chad's ability to communicate with beings on the other side of the veil while in the temple. Lori visited the Mormon temple on a regular basis and indicated that she could speak with the beings on the other side of the veil while sitting in the celestial room. Through the text messages, I learned that Lori, Chad, and many other followers believed in light and dark spirits. These spirits were given a numerical score and the dark spirits that were taking over a person's body were referred to by other names. It seemed as if Melanie Nice, Alex Cox, and Melanie Gibb would often reach out to Lori asking her to get rid of the dark spirits or inquire as to if someone was possessed by such a spirit. In reviewing this iCloud account, I was able to establish the following timeline. And then it says 11... 17, 2018, Lori's audio file shows the recorded speech given by Chad in Arizona. And then that goes on and we will catch up to all of that stuff at some point too. Like we said, rabbit hole after rabbit hole. But I do want to tell you about something that was found in May on these computers. May, back in May. So two months before Charles was murdered, there was an image of a Malachite stone similar to the stone that Chad and Lori's wedding ring, potentially showing plans to marry as early as May of 2019. And that would be the same stone as the wedding rings that Chad and Lori later purchased for their marriage. So there was some brewing going on well before Charles was even murdered. Clearly, and probably really good for trial, when it comes down to Charles's murder, that there was premeditated stuff going on that they planned to be together. So that is really super duper duper interesting. And we'll get into the Malachite because I have some really good theories that I put out there from a, one of my listeners gave me some information on Malachite and really pointed out that Lori is very much into symbolism and Malachite is very dangerous and it is a poison and it can kill people. So did they use Malachite to murder down the road? We'll dig into that rabbit hole at some point as well. On July 30th, 2019, Chad Daybell texts Lori Vallow about Tammy's death percentages. Tammy is Chad's wife. On July 30th, 2019, Chad sent Lori an SMS message that read, I got the inspiration to go back to my original death percentages that helped us track Charles, Ned, etc. Tammy is very close. Her percentage has fallen steadily since Hiplos left. It is encouraging. Heart emoji and kissy lips emoji. 
Also on that day, there's a message that said, yes, we might need to release a little steam when we talk to flame emojis. Ew, 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 ew. Does that mean what I'm assuming it means? Oh my God, Chad. Ugh, ugh. Oh my goodness. No, really? Ugh, get that vision out of my head, please. Oh boy. Okay. <sighs> Yes, we might need to release a little steam when we talk to fire emojis. Anyway, this is the chart that checks what percentage mortals are still in their body. It worked for my friend's wife who died, my neighbor, George Bush, Stan Lee, etc. I kind of forgot about it because we've been dealing with zombies and demonic entities. But this afternoon, Tammy said she felt lightheaded as if her body and spirit weren't connected. Was he poisoning her? This is July 30th, two weeks after Charles was murdered. He's saying that Tammy's getting close. Also in late July, Lori Vallow allegedly texts Charles Vallow's sister Kay, having just discovered she had been removed as sole beneficiary from Charles Vallow's $1 million life insurance policy. Kay says she wrote something to the effect of five kids and no money and his sister gets everything. Here's a clip. And on to other developments in this case, it's information being speculated on for weeks, but now we've got confirmation that Lori Vallow's former husband, Charles, removed her as beneficiary to a $1 million life insurance policy just months before his death. She sent me a picture of the change of beneficiary form and she wrote a note underneath it and it went something like five kids and no money and his sister gets everything. Late July of 2019, the last time Kay Woodcock says she heard from Lori Vallow regarding her brother's $1 million life insurance policy. Just weeks after Chandler police say Lori's brother, Alex Cox, shot her husband Charles Vallow to death in self-defense. Kate tells me Charles removed Lori as his sole beneficiary five months before his death. He wanted to make sure his adopted son, JJ, would be taken care of. Tell me how to split it, and you, y'all are going to need that money because JJ is expensive with all of his special needs. In early September, Lori pulled JJ out of Life Academy, a school tailored to help with his autism. She had already moved JJ and her daughter, Tylee, to Idaho. Charles' attorney, Taylor Larson, says he advised his client to make the beneficiary change when he initially filed for divorce. Because of the circumstances surrounding it with him fearing for his life, really stressing to us there's some credibility here. And so we went ahead and, and advised him to change it right away. Kay and Larry Woodcock have not seen JJ since a quick FaceTime call in August. They believe the crucial change in Charles's million-dollar policy played a factor in the disappearance of JJ and Tylee. Our word was that, you know, we'll, we'll take care of J.J. Whether we had a penny from Charles or we didn't. And the Woodcocks just got out of court. They're trying to get guardianship of J.J. in hopes that he is found safe. They tell me the life insurance policy is not affected by whether or not they have custody of him. For more on this case, go to fox10phoenix.com. And here is a little moment of Lori appearing to be a normal person singing with her sister Summer Shiflet at a birthday celebration for a friend by the name of Melissa, apparently. Here's a clip of that. This was just a few years before as well, before all this went down. Love 
awake and love the drug and how she loves her man. And when it comes to reading books, So that wraps up July of 2019, and we will continue to go through this timeline. And believe me, folks, it gets even crazier than it has already. Thank you so much for listening to Afterglow. Please share this podcast wherever you can. For anyone that's interested in the Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell case, I will see you next week. Stay safe. Stay well. Bye-bye. I'm Kathy Brooks. Sources for this podcast were Justin Lump, Fox 10 Phoenix, Nate Eaton, East Idaho News, and Kresha Easton of YouTube channel Difficult Research. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it, and we will see you soon. Theme music by Dan Lebowitz.